Thank you. Uh, so, uh, thank you all for coming to this Open Education Week webinar. Uh, this is entitled, What We Can Learn from UK OER. Uh, we'll be introducing what uh, UK OER actually was um, and telling you a bit about our approach to uh, getting our findings out of it and what those uh, findings were in a second. I just want to start by introducing my co-presenters who are actually going to be doing most of the work. So I'm going to call them the actual presenters. I'm kind of like a, a sub uh, a presenter who just kind of comes in occasionally. So um, Alison Littlejohn, Professor Alison Littlejohn, she is based in the Caledonian Institute at Glasgow Caledonian University. And uh, Lou McGill, who is a, uh, a consultant, uh, these are the two people along with their uh, 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 colleagues, uh, Helen Beesom and Isabel Falconer, that have been leading the evaluation and synthesis project that's been linked to uh, UK OER in each of the three years of its funded life. Uh, so they're going to be primarily presenting on their approach uh, uh, to evaluation and synthesis and on their findings, which I am sure you will agree are very interesting. And I'm looking forward to this presentation as much as you are, because this is stuff that we've not really talked about in public yet. The actual evaluation and resource uh, evaluation and synthesis report is not actually completely finished yet. There's a couple of other things we'd like to add. So this is uh, very much um, a first look at this. So um, just tell you a little bit about the background to the program. I've called this the first three years. I don't think we're going to get a fourth year of funding. But as you'll see later, I don't think we can stop the momentum that we've started. Even by not giving any money, people are still doing this stuff. So we've been uh, uh, running over three uh, uh, years. There's been uh, lots of activity, lots of project in each of the uh, three uh, years. But you can broadly separate it out into three themes. In the first year, I mean, uh, the UK came to OER kind of late. We started off in 2009, after a, a lot of discussion in 2008, um, we wanted to look at what actually is the most sustainable uh, way of releasing OER, uh, what's the most practical way of releasing OER. We looked at projects that were based across entire institutions that were uh, centered entirely on particular individual academics and that were based on uh, consortium institutions uh, uh, based around uh, the old LTSN subject centers in the UK, which are uh, groupings of staff interested in learning and teaching practice around the uh, uh, particular subject areas. In phase two, we started looking at discovery and use and extending the approaches that we had identified in phase one. That actually was a very interesting year. We learned a lot. I'd recommend particularly with that one looking at the OER use report, uh, sometimes also known as the impact study. You'll see it cited a lot in the uh, literature as Masterman and Wild. And that's an excellent uh, piece of research and academic um, approaches uh, to OER and open practice. We learned a lot from that. Phase three, we reckoned we'd uh, gotten the uh, uh, hang of this OER stuff. So we started out looking at how we could use open practices and OER to solve particular problems institutions were will, will, uh, facing. Uh, if you're a higher education uh, policy wonk like myself, you probably spotted that we went through a pretty profound change in higher education in England uh, during this time. And we were uh, particularly interested in uh, whether open practice could address some of the strategic and cultural challenges that this new model of higher education funding presented. 
and we also took a good hard look at the kind of uh, technology support that we could uh, offer people and that might be needed. On that, I would recommend uh, the Into the Wild ebook, which is uh, going to be, be uh, published imminently in a, a hard copy as well. That was Alice. That, that was Adam. No, actually, it wasn't. That was Amber Thomas uh, uh, and uh, uh, Lorna Campbell and Phil Parker. Uh, those last two from CETIS. I would certainly recommend taking a look at that if you get a chance. Uh, going alongside each of these years of activity, we offered uh, technical support, support on IPR and legal matters, uh, the evaluation and synthesis team that you're looking at, uh, Terry uh, McAndrew at uh, TechDiffs is as uh, advice on accessibility in OER. So there's lots of great resources there actually on uh, doing OER. A lot of that is collected in the OER InfoKit, which has been expanding and becoming pretty much a complete guide to uh, doing OER, uh, UK OER style, and also incorporates a number of the findings from the research that's been going on alongside it. If you want to dive more deeply in uh, to the evaluation and synthesis work, I would recommend uh, the um, um, evaluation and synthesis wiki. Uh, both of the, those uh, last two resources that I mentioned, we can thank uh, the efforts of uh, Lou McGill for uh, pulling those uh, uh, together. So, so it's been an absolutely uh, fascinating uh, three years of work. We uh, feel like we've learned a lot. We uh, feel like uh, we've established a pretty sound uh, 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 I can't we feel like we, we've established a pretty sound community. Uh, they're incredibly active on social media and blogging. They're also meeting together for a conference in uh, Nottingham in the next couple of weeks, which is called OER 13. So please look out for tweets and materials from that over the coming weeks. So I'm going to now hand over to my uh, colleagues Alison and uh, Lou. I'm not certain which one is going to do this bit, so we'll have to see. I'm not sure we can hear you, Alison. Can you uh, check that your microphone's turned on, please? Okay. Can you hear me now? That's much better. Thank you. Okay. Um, as David said, this was a really exciting, complex, challenging program um, that we carried out the evaluation census of. So what I want to do is give you a little bit of flavor of the evaluation census and what it was we were trying to do. Um, the evaluation census was um, led by the Caledonian Academy here at Glasgow Caledonian University in UK. Um, so there was myself and um, Isabel Faulkner, Helen Beetham, and Lou McGill, who as project manager has really been driving forward the whole evaluation and synthesis. Now, what we were trying to do was there were over 80 projects involved over the three years. And we were trying to draw the lessons learned from the program. So looking at the big picture. And also to make sure that project teams could work together to not only identify the challenges they face, but um, disseminate some of the solutions. Uh, and while these are contextualized within specific institutions, uh, we could still pick out the, the key lessons learned. So um, when we were trying to look at the, the lessons that we were learning around open educational resources, and open educational practices. We had to figure out a way of capturing these lessons from a very complex picture. What I'd like to do is to start off by asking you to think about 
how might we capture these lessons, how might we measure impact, and uh, what kind of lessons do you think that we're likely to learn? So just take a minute or two to type some thoughts into the text chat box and let's see what you come up with. So firstly, if we think about what is it that you think that we're likely to, to be looking at? Thanks for your input, Christina. Across the program, what kind of lessons do you think it is that we're likely to learn? Yeah, thanks a lot, Murray. And that was really important. What makes people engage with who we are? So what are the motivations behind them? Um, approaches that would generate the, the best OER, we are, yep, benefits buyers. Yeah, changing attitudes. Thanks for that, Janet. So um, one of the things that it's important to think about is the fact that within the program, we were dealing with a whole range of different stakeholders. So these were individual academics, support staff, students. Um, we also started working with people from other sectors. So we had um, people working in industry, um, people in charities, and so on. And all of these people were working in different kinds of groupings and organizations. So we had people working in universities, in colleges, in schools, in companies. We had people working as individuals and within communities of practice. The communities of practice that we worked with tend to be focused around subject communities or professional communities. And we had people working across a range of different sectors. So this is quite a complex factor, and uh, we're looking at some of the quality, technical, legal issues that um, David mentioned earlier in the introduction. So finding an instrument that would help us to, to draw out key lessons from this quite complex uh, scenario was challenging. I'm going to hand over to Lou, who's going to tell us a little bit more about how we achieve this. Okay, hi everybody. Um, as, as Alison's uh, identified, there's sort of quite a complex set of uh, different things that we needed to find out. There were hundreds of questions that we were asking um, at both project level and at program level. And um, so one of the things that we did was we developed an evaluation and synthesis framework. And um, we tried to make the framework be um, reflect what the projects themselves wanted to find out, but also we had to um, make sure that it reflected what the funders uh, wanted to find out. So it was quite challenging to produce a framework that was easy to engage with, but um, the framework that we developed was iterative. So we actually have uh, several several different uh, versions of the framework on our. Um, on our wiki, um, and I wouldn't over worry about which version means what. I think that the key point about it, this is that um, we started with a framework that kind of showed what we thought we'd want to know, and as the as we went through the three phases, the framework was adjusted and adapted to reflect what we were finding out and to ask different questions. And it actually helped us to think about the questions in a more detailed way. And, um, and the focus around culture and practice became really evident um, uh, as being a key, a key thing we were learning about. 
and um, which I think has been one of the most interesting things about working in, uh, with this program. So we wanted the framework to inform and reflect the evaluation questions of projects. So when a project started, we wanted to help them by giving them some questions that we were already looking at. And they could select which ones they felt were appropriate in their own context. We also wanted the framework to support project reporting. And some people utilized the framework to, um, to frame their, the, the in information they found out through their evaluation activities. And importantly for us as a team, the, the framework has to have to reflect the big picture of the program and try to bring things together and help us synthesize the lessons learned. And may I just say, you know, this has not been an easy feat. This is a very complex program. So one of the problems that we had was that because the framework actually was quite complex, um, we had to try and break it down. Eventually, we, um, we did produce an evaluation toolkit to help projects engage with the framework. And we attempted to make the framework, uh, the toolkit, sorry, um, allow for different ways of, of being and different ways of looking at things. So um, we tried to break it down into um, you did make us hard, David. <laughs> we we broke the, it down into these four areas that you can see here under key focus areas. Culture and practice, releasing and using OERs, uh, processes for sustainability, and impacts and benefits. And within each of those, there are several different breakdowns, which lead right down to individual questions that we were asking. Um, if you're interested, please do go and have a look. The, the key point about the toolkit was that it gave people a different way into the toolkit, um, into the framework. So we offered um, the way in through these four key areas at the top. We also offered a visual way using um, a spicy nodes concept mapping. For people who preferred to see things visually, we thought that might help. And some, people, some of the projects responded quite well to that, that visual view of things. And also, we linked it to, to themes that they were addressing to try and make it feel much more relevant to their context. And some people just preferred to link to the framework in its entirety and see that bigger picture, how it all fit together. Um, worth going and have a look if you're interested in the methodology. And um, we also gave projects quite a lot of resources to support, to support them. So we had evaluation resources, how to evaluate, what kind of evidence we were looking for. That was a, a difficult one for projects to understand. And, so we had to just um, try and give them our examples. And so one of the things we did was include sample outputs. So as UK OER projects produced evaluation materials, produced content that showed impact and how they'd measured impact, we shared it with the, the, um, with the program. But uh, one of the things, and we also had an evaluation buddies uh, mechanism, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about in a moment. So um, here's a nice thing that somebody said about us in their, um, in their final report for phase three. And um, what, they, what they are doing here is endorsing, really, the approach we took. And I think it was quite an interesting approach for um, JISC as a program to take. And um, it, I think it's been fairly effective. Of course, I would. I am biased because I've been so involved in that. But we did get some really good feedback from some of the projects. Some projects did find it too, you know, rather complex um, to to engage with. But one of the things that this um, this lovely quote there says. I hope you've had time to to have a look at that. Is um, they mentioned the uh, the evaluation buddy system, which was. Um, uh, precipitated a sharing of thinking and practices among clusters of similar projects. And I think this is a really interesting aspect of the, of the evaluation uh, support that we provided. And it, it was really intended to help projects connect with each other. Um, I, think, I think one of the key aspects of this program that, that we should highlight, as David has already said, is that you know, the community that is developed from this program of work is very strong, is very, very committed, and um, 
and maybe you know even without the evaluation bodies it would have been um, it would have been equally as strong but we hope we think that the evaluation bodies mechanisms help people start talking to each other it was intended to help them offer opportunities for peer review and have a neutral place to talk to sound ideas a picture on the screen there is of two buddies um, uh, two of the projects who met and recorded a video of their evaluation chats and shared it with the wider community. Uh, Anna from the Deaf Project, there's a little link at the bottom there, um, wrote a fantastic uh, blog post about the impact of the evaluation buddy meeting that we had with them. But I think the important thing as well as supporting projects to share ideas, experiences, resources, um, it also enhanced that development of the UK OER community. And I'm going to hand back to David now to, because he, just to let him talk a little bit about, more about the community. Um, in some ways, I feel like I'm the least qualified person to talk about the community because I was the funder. I was like the person that was supposedly in charge of this whole mess. And uh, what we try to do right from the start is to encourage a community, encourage people to talk to each other, to sh share ideas, to share insights. But we try to get them to do it uh, openly on the web uh, rather than just doing it on a closed mailing list or something where you wouldn't necessarily see it. Uh, thinking that that activity uh, would attract other people into talking and thinking about uh, the ideas around UK OER. Uh, one of the primary tools that we used for that was uh, 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 social media. There's been lots and lots of really interesting blogging. Uh, there's been a lot of activity on uh, Twitter as well. As you can see, uh, these two uh, visualizations by Martin Hawksey are a way to try and catch what he likes to call the uh, 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 heart of OER the uh, still beating heart of OER, if you will, and to, to try and uh, capture the fact that it connects in a lot of people, that it br uh, brings uh, together people all across the world, uh, all different kinds of institutions and uh, bodies uh, with all different uh, kinds of role, stuff like that. Um, it was, I think, it's the first time uh, JSCAN the Academy uh, had worked with a program in this way. I mean, I think it was, uh, it kind of started off at the same time as uh, Twitter kind of starting to go mainstream. So we've kind of uh, uh, we've kind of led the way on this and. The interesting thing that happened is uh, the community started to support itself. I mean, rather than just ringing me up as the program manager or ringing Lou up as the uh, evaluation lead and saying, help, I'm not sure what to do, uh, rather than talking directly to uh, Naomi Khan, our amazing IPR support team, or to Lorna Campbell and uh, Phil Barker at seats on technical stuff. The first time the question would be asked actually would be out in the open. And those people that were uh, being uh, paid to support them uh, were there. But also so were lots and lots of other people that would uh, come in and uh, support them, offer different answers, uh, different insights. Uh, different ways of looking at the problem space that that particular person was uh, facing. And that was incredibly powerful. I mean, out of that community has uh, come uh, the, 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 the OER uh, conferences that we have in the UK, has come the Open Education Special Interest uh, Group that has recently formed, has come lots and lots of other activities activity that's uh, kind of been based around the power of that uh, community. So I think I hand back to Lou now, is it? Uh, it's Thanks, 
No, but Alison, that's fine. You can go from there. I've just I just moved the slide on to highlight that um, the great tag debate, which we won't go into detail here, but if you follow the link that I'm about to share in the uh, uh, um, text chat at some point, uh, you'll see a really nice blog post that talks about um, a, a debate that was had around whether we still use the tag UK OER. I'll leave you to um, to find out what, what we decided about that, but the important point that we wanted to emphasize was that this community is still passionate, still debating, still arguing about metadata and, and having challenging conversations even though the funding period is long gone. <laughs> Alison. Okay, thanks for that, Lou. Um, as Lou said, there was a, a great feeling of uh, community across the program. And so we were interested in the benefits of this. Um, so I'd like to ask you some of your thoughts about what you think the benefits might be in terms of taking a community approach. So you have communities of people releasing resources um, as opposed to perhaps uh, individuals or, or simply program teams. So take one minute to think about and put into the text box some of your ideas about the benefits of communities. Yep, as Lou says, um, people are already sharing practice, so they, they have established patterns of working together. Yep, sustainability. Yep, <laughs> share Twitter, so you already have the networks, ideas, support, and cooperation. Yeah, all of these are, are great benefits of communities. Anything else? Okay, well, common goals, thanks for that, Lou. What, what I want to do is um, to tell you a little bit about a sub-study from the evaluation and synthesis. Um, what we did was to identify and surface some of the relatively unseen benefits and barriers. We did an activity analysis. And uh, some of you might be familiar with uh, the work of uh, Yuri Engström, and there's a, a URL there, and someone can, can uh, put this into the chat box so that you can follow up. But uh, the idea here is that we were looking at the release of open educational resources as an activity system. And so if you're familiar with the idea of um, activity analysis, and you know that there is this um, triangle framework which can be used to, to analyze the system. So here, we, as our subjects, we had the project teams who were working on releasing open educational resources. And so the object of their activity was to release open educational resources. And so we have uh, on the screen in the PowerPoint an example of an activity system from one of the project groups. This is uh, Open Spires, which was a project based at Oxford. So the important aspects of this activity system are that people are using a variety of different tools to produce and release these open educational resources. There's a community of people who are working on producing the resources. And that community have known rules. And in terms of open educational resources, these rules tend to focus around uh, intellectual property rights, um, creative commons, and so on, quality assurance. And also, individuals have uh, specific roles. So what we did was um, we looked at all the projects, and uh, we assembled these uh, activity triangles and we tried to look at some of the benefits of the communities and some of the tensions that lay within the communities. So some of the benefits 
we found that uh, the existing communities shared practices. So some of these existing communities might be within institutions, groups of people who had been working together within a university or a college. And some of them were the subject centres hosted by the Higher Education Academy that had been uh, in existence for years. Um, so these communities had these common goals and aims. They had existing patterns of working um, and they were using tools and technologies that they were familiar with. Also, the quality issues that they had, the way that they viewed a specific resource, tended to be in a very similar way. So there were lots of benefits. And what we found was that the most effective and efficient production and release of resources tended to be amongst these communities. However, when we dig a little bit deeper, we also found a whole range of tensions around the communities. For example, open educational resource projects tended to have um, the greatest impact where communities were already collaborating, but in situations where people didn't have an existing working relationship, new collaborations were difficult to, to initiate. And uh, while the, the value of open exchange of knowledge was widely recognized, uh, people were not always committed to sharing or using resources. And we found a lot of academics wanted to retain control over the open educational resources they released within the communities or sub-communities um, that they opened up the resources to. So we found examples of communities or people within communities preferring to release content only within that community itself. So there were issues in terms of the, the tools that people were using. For example, sometimes we identified tensions in uh, the way that people within communities were using these technologies. One example is that there could be a perceived need for resources to be stable and archived. Uh, content resources with good version tracking and so on. And that came into conflict with other communities who used different pedagogic approaches where learners were co-creating resources um, as um, consumers and producers, so so-called prosumers. So there was a tension there in, in the way that people viewed um, both the resources and the tools to produce these resources. Uh, and in general, we found that these new and emerging practices were sometimes at odds with the mainstream academic practices uh, resulting in tensions. And there were also tensions around the, the rules of the communities. Uh, for example, people in uh, project teams maybe sometimes wanted to allow people outside their university or college to deposit resources within uh, an enterprise repository uh, run by the university. And that could be difficult uh, because sometimes this was uh, viewed as not a very good thing to do. So we identified a whole range of tensions there. And um, overall, we found that there was this tension between the notion of bounded communities and open release of resources. So, Although communities are helpful in terms of helping to produce and release resources, there is this idea that communities are actually bounded um, and people tend to think about producing resources that can be used within those communities rather than out in the wild, so to speak. So I've listed here a whole range of different tensions that we identified within the communities. And here's a quote from a chapter that um, we're writing. So uh, Lou, Isabel and I are going to publish this chapter in a new book, uh, which is going to be published by Routledge at the end of this year, reusing open resources. So this just highlights this antithesis between the idea of a safe, trusted, bounded community and open practice and open release. So I'm going to now hand over to Lou 
who's going to talk about this a bit further. Okay, well, um, we wanted to have an opportunity to see if, um, if some of the things we've been saying resonate with any of yourselves. I think um, one of the things that um, that people do focus on when we talk about how how communities get together to both support OER use but also release, um, people tend to focus on those positive aspects. And um, what we wanted to do today really was talk with you about these more challenging aspects um, and find out, you know, have you experienced any of these tensions yourselves? You know, have you tried to reuse resources that have been produced by, with such a kind of narrow focus that you haven't been able to reuse them? And, you know, have, how we might. Um, benefit from the strengths of community approaches, but mitigate the risks of them being too uh, too focused. So what Christina um, asked an interesting question in the chat box about, well, you know, what why would anybody want to restrict it used to just within a community? And actually there are quite a few reasons why that might happen in a in a kind of um, obvious way. But even if um, the community appears to be very open and really interested in releasing to a broader context. The very fact that they have these rules and um, and diff, uh, you know shared goals and common view of the world means that the resulting OER may actually not be pedagogically very accessible outside that community. They may not be technically accessible outside that community. And I'm just wondering if anybody wants to take the mic to talk about to comment on any of the things we've said so far, please um, pop your hand up and we'd, we'd love to hear from you as well as in the chat box. So I'll just um, give you a chance to type your thoughts and, um, and experiences into the chat box and uh, I'll try and catch up with that. Yeah, Viv's point there about, um, you know, the greatest restriction is the technology format. Um, really important. There are still major issues, despite everything that we've learned, despite what we know about reusability, um, about different formats. People are still publishing things in, in formats that um, don't allow for adaptability or for adaptation and reuse. So they may only be reusable within very limited context. Sam's point, tension between openness and the market economy. That is interesting, uh, yes, um, that did come up a lot in, um, certainly in the, in the phase three, that was quite a significant issue. Um, sometimes it comes up in, at, at the level of community. So for example, some of the, um, some of the projects who were in the art and design world felt there was a real tension between getting students to be open about their their own content and to consider aspects of open practice because I, I must just emphasize students were, were very involved in this as producers of content, not just as consumers or what you might expect them to be. That is very interesting. Um, but also um, they um, you know, the whole notion of artists producing work for commercial, you know, for their professional well, well-being, you know, to, to manage their profession, to live from, was, was felt to be a completely uh, opposite to the whole open concept. However, another project, the Conk project in Coventry, made their courses open in a, in a range of the open media courses and uh, found a huge benefit in moving towards open. Um, David, do you want to come in and talk about the the broader issue, you know, the, the issue of market economy at the broader institution level rather than subject community level? I can certainly try. I'm not sure. I mean, for me, uh, uh, this kind of issue links back to the uh, nature of uh, project funding, which is something that a lot of this work uh, has been uh, stuck in. I mean, most uh, big OER initiatives have come from 
a particular time slice of funding that's gone to a particular institution. And the single project funding is uh, you're asked to report at uh, the end of the project on uh, uh, during the project on what you've done and uh, uh, why you've done it and uh, whether it's been any good. Now, if you're doing this with materials, the obvious thing to reach for is uh, how many people have used it, how many people have commented on it, and it is incredibly difficult to get that if you're just releasing openly to the uh, uh, whole uh, uh, world. Also, as uh, lose, uh, and if you're making resources and you're not certain about actually whether they're uh, going to be useful or not, it's really useful to work with people that you know are going to be using the resources because uh, they can uh, trial them, uh, you can iterate. This happens to a lesser extent with uh, wider release. Uh, you occasionally get emails from random people saying this is really good, but can I have it in this format? Or can you let me have the source images or stuff like that? But it's less uh, reliable and it's uh, more difficult to demonstrate impact. And this is where Christina and Sam's conversation in the chat is really, really interesting that um, it is a tension with the idea of a marketplace, like if you're releasing OER, uh, you've actually become a publisher. And there was a temptation to see yourself in competition with uh, publishers in the wider sense. I mean, why should you use a book that's been published by uh, uh, Pearson or uh, Hotter Headline or something like that I mean, when you could use OER? So it becomes almost competitive. But they have much better data than we do because OER is such a viral thing. Uh, you just stick it up there and off it goes and you have no idea really uh, who's using it or where it's being used or who's republishing it. Um, it is harder for us to make the claims about the massive uh, reuse and unfortunately that does tend to be the kind of thing that impresses institutions, that impresses uh, funders. Uh, I think that uh, uh, we here probably understand that uh, releasing things openly is a good thing in itself. And stuff like the long tail effect, which is a, a slightly theoretically dubious concept, but is uh, useful here, that if just kind of one or two people use your resource and it uh, happens in uh, 10 years' time, but it completely solves their problem and it kind of really transforms their practice, then that surely is much more important than uh, being able to say, oh, 5,000 people looked at this resource on the repository and half of them downloaded it. You don't really know what they've done with it. And that's something institutions and funders, I think, struggle with quite a lot. So I shall uh, hand back to my colleagues now. Thanks, David. Yeah, uh, really important points. And I think the other the other tension uh, around the openness and the market economy model of higher education is that people are wondering why institutions might consider opening up their resources. And um, and the answer is uh, there's several motivations for institutions to kind of engage with the open educational practice. I, I think it, I think it's important to stress that you know we've looked at release by individuals, um, which is what David was just talking about. We've looked at in, release by communities of people or groups of people, and we also looked at institutional release. And um, one of the interesting elements of the inst motivations for institutions to release is that um, it, there, are, there are actually loads of benefits to an institution to release. And I'm not going to list them here, but you can find those on our wiki. But um, what is a, a significant benefit that is quite convincing if you're trying to encourage an institution to go down this route is that whole marketing model. And this is where you do get into the kind of business speak, because institutions are perceiving that if they don't um, go down that route, they, uh, they lose an opportunity to be placed in a global um, 
to be visible in a global field, really. So um, by making their OER high quality OER, and this this does affect on the kind of uh, quality of OER that it gets released. Um, highly branded, high quality OER from institutions can have a significant impact on their marketing and their visibility, their reputation. And, and you know, it does have an impact then. That's very different from your academic, as, as Chris said, you know, uh, sorry, Chris, um, Christina said, you know, I, I might like to make just my, put my stuff out there and see if others want to use it that's great, you know. Um, it's very different from the individual model. Um, but it's got to be remembered that individuals might be within an institution that has a policy on OER or that has restrictions on how you release your OER. If, if institutions become very aware of that branding aspect, they may want to control what you release as OER and, they, and it may impact on what you can release. It may change the way you release things. Sorry, because that's a whole other area, but it was just such an interesting question. Does anybody else, does anybody, does anybody want to take the mic and uh, I'm just going to try and catch up with from, uh, Krista. Um, I'm wondering yeah. if she could take the mic at this point. I'll try and catch up with that as well. Hello, can you hear me then? Yes. Yeah, sound great. Yeah. Hi. Well, I was involved with um, the Stuffs Uni uh, round one project and it, it was obviously noticeable that people were concerned about giving away some of their resources. Also, obviously, there were issues around like copyright and things like that because what you use in a classroom and what you put out there can be completely different things. But I just wondered whether you thought that in rounds two and three of the OER projects, whether we'd got past that that fear at the academic level, you know, about what they were giving away. Was it was there still worry about intellectual property going out there? Yeah, that's a really good question. And um, I think I think the answer is every time when when um, in phase three, if if an institution in involved in one of the phase three projects had already been involved in phase one or phase two, that level of understanding was at such a different level. And um, but whenever you took the notion of this to any new academic in that institution or to any any new academic in your subject community, um, they were also um, raising exactly the same points because it comes from that fear of opening up your practice. Um, there, were, there were fears as well as the ones you mentioned. There were fears about um, is my stuff good enough to release openly? Um, there were fears about, well, you know, I've knocked up this PowerPoint and in it there are three photos and I can't remember where I got them, you know. Fears around the legality of things and making things uh, transparent. So um, I think the answer to your question is you know, it, every time new academics, uh, new teachers, new educators are engaged with this, they need to be, they need to have those fears um, way late, but certainly that it was it has been significant that um, the the projects really w once people did engage and, and once they understood what the benefits were, they outweighed these challenges. And we write a lot about that in our wiki. I'm very conscious of time here. Um, it might be it might be worth me moving on to the next um, slide because this is where it kind of follows on from um, what you've just been saying really. Um, open educational these are just some extra lessons to, to be honest you know I could talk about each of these for a whole hour so I will, I will, I'll try not to bore you to death but um, we have got a link to the summary page of the key lessons from UK OER 3 and we are currently writing the review of the whole three years which is uh, equally challenging if not more challenging um, but um, these are the kind of these are just some of the highlights that I've uh, pulled out from from the, the key lessons that emerged, and one of them follows on from what we were just talking about, which is that 
Open educational practice was really embraced by a really wide range of stakeholders once they understood what the benefits were and, and it took a huge amount of effort from project teams to engage all these different stakeholders and I don't just mean teachers, I mean people within this educational sector and outside the educational sector. It takes huge resource to engage people to articulate what the benefits are and to get that buy-in but actually once you do that um, you know, people are really open to changing their practice because it does require change and that's the other, uh, the other points that are on this uh, thing. Institutions have had to develop new strategies, policies, procedures and infrastructure to, to support change in practice. You know, if an institution has a strategy or a policy that supports open practice, you've got much more chance of getting people within the institution to, to become involved and change, you know. Um, it does it's sort of engaging with open courses and OER offers an opportunity to look at your existing practice and pedagogy. Uh, that can be challenging, really, um, but it can be quite liberating and gives you an opportunity to talk across institutions. That, in particular, was a significant aspect. Um, and David's mentioned the, the University of Leeds policy, that's fantastic, um, and DMU, I know Viv's here, She's, uh, they've, done, they've really taken an institutional um, approach to kind of, you know, making sure that the work that's been done is sustainable, carries on, keeps developing, because we're just at a snapshot in time of what the funding's helped us achieve within these institutions. There's a lot to learn from these institutions, though, um, but there is a real challenge in getting that out to other institutions that weren't directly funded. Uh, Christy, yeah, um, I, I don't know if Debbie can find you the link to that policy from Leeds, but it's really worth looking at. Um, as we've said, not all OER are open, accessible or adaptable for wider use, both technically and pedagogically. I know that Marion Manton from Oxford was here, or she sort of looks like she's had to go, but um, they found they tried really hard to reuse some of the content that was produced in the earlier phases of UK OER. And even within even within that context, even though we're in this similar UK context, um, there were challenges around reusing some of that material for the reasons that we've already been touching on today. And also there is a significant appetite outside the sector to investigate open approaches but it takes a lot of effort. Um, we've had some brilliant results from uh, engaging with commercial publishers, also the public sector and also charities. Uh, again, that is information is included on our wiki. Oh, I'm so conscious of time here. There are also some technical lessons which are listed on this slide that I've just put up. Again, if you really want to find out what the technical challenges and things we discovered, then you ought to look at the technology uh, for open educational resources into the WOW document. Um, but, you know, it'd be no surprise to know that third party materials still present a significant barrier to release and use. The, um, over the course of the um, of the program, there was a significant attempt to produce in as many formats as possible and across multiple platforms to improve discoverability and accessibility. Uh, we also need to make sure that open uh, that metadata is uh, also openly licensed and capturing and managing paradata. Uh, and which is activity data about the learning resource. We've touched on that as we've gone through. Whilst not the only measures of the value of an OER uh, have been significantly important. Now I'm going to pass over to David. I'm sorry because we're really close to the edge in terms of time. Sorry, I'm sorry I've talked so fast through all of that as well. Uh, thanks, Lou. We have covered a lot here and we've put a lot of links in the chat. Uh, we'll try and get these links up on a blog somewhere as soon as possible afterwards and we can tweet about it. Uh, um, there's actually quite a lot of this stuff already on Alison Littlejohn's blog and if uh, you go to the evaluation and synthesis of wiki, there's lots of stuff there to look at. So, I mean, reflections in the future, obviously the uh, funded life of the program has ended and we're faced with the prospect now of supporting a community that we don't really have any control over. 
and we want to make sure that community stays open, uh, stays uh, friendly and approachable. It is, as many people said in chat, it's a nice community. It's a helpful community. You get a lot of interacting with them. So I mean, uh, definitely for people on this uh, uh, webinar, uh, do look at uh, UKOER on Twitter. Uh, do uh, uh, join uh, the OER uh, uh, discuss list on Gmail. If somebody could stick a link to that in the chat room, I would be very delighted. Um, so, I mean, institutions, I would say at the moment, they're panicking. Uh, there's been a lot of changes to institutional finance, uh, to the way institutions are funded in England. This is mirrored across the world, I think. There's a lot of movement to uh, a less uh, uh, reliable stream of uh, funding. Uh, government direct funding for institutions is going down a lot. We're seeing a rise of student loans instead. Um, and keeping uh, UK aware of the part of this it is going to be difficult, but we are, I think we've proved that this program has got a lot of advantages that can offer institutions and individuals a lot. It can uh, raise profile, it can showcase excellent work and resources. Uh, Lou, I wanted you to share, I've forgotten what it was now, um, the link to the OER uh, discuss uh, list on uh, JISCMIL. That would be lovely. Uh, so, taking forward people outside the sector, I mentioned in the, the uh, uh, chat earlier, there was a project in, in uh, Newcastle uh, led by the amazing Megan Quentin Baxter and Suzanne Hardy, who were actually working directly with Elsevier. Uh, uh, how can we um, in, uh, incorporate Elsevier images in? to OER that uh, we released. I mean, often they've got really, really good diagrams and stuff that you just want to get in there. Um, so, I mean, uh, MIT, I think, tried this uh, back in 2002, 2004. Elsevier said no, no chance. But that seems to be shifting. It appears uh, to be opening up a little, and that's really, really exciting stuff. A uh, question from Krista, just to finish, uh, will there be funding for more OER projects? I can say if uh, 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 we support the uh, creation of more learning materials or the release of learning materials in any way, they uh, will be OER by default. If people uh, release materials uh, uh, via a GISC project, we'd expect them uh, to be open unless uh, there's a really, really good reason for them not to be. Uh, we've not had the direct chunk of hefty funding that we got to do the first three years, so it's not likely there is going to be a, a UK OER program as such. But you'll see the open approaches, uh, the OER approaches, incorporated in pretty much everything we do. Um, I'm conscious that we're slightly over time. I can stay a little bit longer from for questions. Um, so the slides are on SlideShare, the links are all going down the chat. Um, if you're new to the area and you want a little bit of a clue on the kind of uh, jargon we've been uh, uh, using, this is a really good introduction that uh, Lou has done. It's been shared a lot on uh, Twitter already, but I would recommend this as a a really good starting point uh, just in to this world and the kind of things people talk about. So if somebody could put that link in here, that would be lovely. Uh, excellent, you found it on Twitter already and you've shared it, so that's what we like to see, sharing. We love sharing. And that points to a lot of other resources, a lot of other stuff that you can read to just kind of uh, 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 get a handle on this. And of course, uh, the info kit that we've talked about already is a, um, a really good introduction into actually doing this stuff. If I could make one point in uh, uh, closing is that um, as it's 
at its simplest, uh, releasing OER is really, really easy. Uh, you make something, you stick it on the web, you tell people about it. That's the most fantastically transformative aspect of all of this. If you couldn't uh, do that, all the rest of this stuff would be worthless. Um, but we've got a lot of stuff that uh, deals with the particular problems that people can uh, face and the uh, solutions that we've found for the actual uh, realities of doing this in an, in an institutional setting, perhaps incorporating content that you've not made. But um, I would say if uh, you're on the brink of uh, starting uh, uh, to release OER, just go for it. It's just it's the best thing. Thank you very much.